All right, everybody. Well, thanks so much for joining. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first of all, wanted to welcome everybody uh, for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today. My name is Jeff Pollock. I'm the Vice President of Products for Oracle's Fast Data Solutions, including Golden Gate, uh, Stream Analytics, Database Migrations, and this webinar will be recorded. Uh, so we will uh, go ahead and uh, repost that out to our um, Oracle Golden Gate YouTube channel. I put the URL here on the, uh, the first screen and then we'll, we'll put it up again at the end. Uh, there is a dedicated playlist um, on the Golden Gate uh, YouTube channel that's focused specifically around this uh, data mesh topic. So we've, we've had a series of presentations so far and you can find the, the full playlist there. Um, I'm actually joined today by uh, several product managers. Uh, Alex and Thomas, thanks for joining me. Um, they'll be on standby to answer questions that come up in the Q&A and the chat areas. So uh, feel free to send questions their way during the, the course of the presentation. And you know, as always, we try to be as accessible as possible afterwards. So if you've got questions that we didn't get a chance to answer online, please hit us up afterwards. <clears throat> Excuse me. As a heads up, um, I do plan to move quickly uh, through the first 10 slides or so, and then we'll slow down as we get into um, some of the more technical content uh, a little bit later. All right, so let's begin by discussing a bit about our recent history in data management. Uh, even as we've kind of recently moved in large scale to cloud computing as the dominant form of technology infrastructure over the past several years, the architecture patterns for how we work with data have largely remained the same really for around the last three decades or so. Um, from ETL tools uh, to data marts, data warehouses, and cloud-based data lakes, the hub and spoke pattern has really been the dominant form of data architecture. It's tried and, and true, it's tested, it's well understood. So really the question we wanna explore during this uh, discussion today is hub and spoke really the the end state destiny for what we do with data management, or is there another way that might be emerging? One truth that cannot be denied, especially with all the recent events in the past few years, is that the world around us is moving ever faster. IT systems and the data that fuel those IT systems uh, need to become uh, more and more responsive, more agile, more resilient to face the demands of the globally interconnected organizations that run them. And in this modern world, the 30-year-old ways of doing data integration are no longer sufficient uh, to really keep pace. You know, many in the industry are writing about these emerging trends that are impacting data integration software. Noel Johanna Forrester has coined the term enterprise data fabric to describe a modern approach uh, to data management. Gartner has also written about data fabrics, and ThoughtWorks, which is a consulting company aligned around agile development and microservices, they've also spearheaded an industry push around uh, data mesh. Gartner has also been a leader in noticing industry trends around stream-centric data management, and many, many others in the industry have noted the hype around service mesh um, in the fast-moving DevOps category for application development and design. And we see kind of this impact of service mesh spanning not only data integration, but also all of the application development community overall. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. So, you know, taken together, these mega trends that we see in the IT industry, you know, they're really coalescing to drive a new generation of data mesh capabilities that will finally leave behind the more monolithic tools of the past, these new generation of data mesh capabilities will interconnect modern multi-cloud data-driven applications uh, to produce analytics, data services, and data products of all types. So we've been working on this data mesh series since early uh, 2020 with part one focusing on the intersection of change data capture and distributed commit log tooling like Apache Kafka. Part two was really a drill down into microservices data tier architectures and the benefits of using microservices design patterns with change data capture. 
part three was around highlighting uh, a specific demonstration that included operating a real-time data mesh with data sources that included SaaS applications, on-premise databases, web-based data services, and also highlighting a cloud-based operating model for streaming ETL. That leads us to today, where we'll drill down in this discussion into data integration design patterns, how the data mesh will improve DevOps productivity for data integration, and we'll highlight how the Golden Gate platform is spearheading industry change in this hot software category. So going all the way back to the 1980s, we have seen two broad coverage areas for integration tools. First, in the area of application integration, technologies like EAI, or it's called uh, Enterprise Application Integration, Service-Oriented Architecture, and most recently, IPaaS, they've all focused on providing transactional integration for business processes that might span multiple business applications. Second, in the area of data integration, tooling like ETL, change data capture, and data virtualization have focused on high-performance data tier integrations. While both app integration and data integration have overlapped occasionally, uh, for example, in the area of like, messaging-based integration, by and large, the focus for data integration has remained very much on producing committed, highly reliable transaction data. For data consistency and regulatory reasons, the core use cases for data integration-based uh, tooling have always been focused on maximizing strong data consistency, correctness of the data, and trust in the data, specifically for those kinds of analytic use cases um, that really require a highly consistent data that's an accurate reflection of the, the data that was generated by the application tier. But, you know, meanwhile, while the data integration market was kind of chugging along over the last uh, 20 or 30 years, there's been massive upheaval in other areas of software development. Most notably, uh, since 2010, there's been a significant change in the way we approach application development design patterns. Uh, decades ago, the standard approach to application development was very monolithic in nature. You know, think mainframes, for example. Later, we really adopted uh, more of a client-server approach that settled into what we refer to as kind of a three-tier application server type architecture, uh, which was somewhat decoupled from the infrastructure that it, that it ran on, but it maintained a lot of uh, tight dependencies across software frameworks, you know, protocols, uh, containers, like uh, application server containers, and shared data models, uh, even in the database tier for the applications that ran inside the app server uh, containers. So in the past 10 years or so, we've really seen this shift uh, towards the right-hand side of the screen, uh, towards more of a modern microservices design approach. Uh, we've really seen that microservices design patterns take off. You know, and most recently in the past couple of years, we've really seen the rise of these service mesh, mesh patterns that take advantage of pod management characteristics from Kubernetes, OpenShift, and, and others. So this newer app dev approach it's much easier to take advantage of modern DevOps uh, development operations like continuous integration, continuous delivery, as well as uh, vendor managed services for serverless workloads running in the cloud, as well as fully managed containers where you may want to host hybrid applications. So, you know, all of this has been going on, you know, just in the past few years. So we've now reached an inflection point for data integration tools uh, to modernize. You know, DI tools, uh, data integration tools must now take the next step into the future. The old days of data integration, we had classic monoliths that required hundreds of interdependent frameworks, um, you know, required tightly coupled hardware selection, uh, storage and compute that could not be scaled independently of one another. You know, more recently in the past 10 to 15 years, we've seen a lot of these client server based approaches. Uh, that did use three-tier uh, based data hubs, and these were more decoupled than the classic monoliths, uh, but they still, um, in many cases, required hooks to specific um, infrastructure, compute, and storage, as well as uh, tightly coupled components with shared software libraries. Um, very few of them uh, did full encapsulation of shared um, or single data models. They, they usually require shared data models across components. 
Um, and so in a modern kind of data mesh deployment architecture, we'll see a lot more uh, flexible, loosely coupled options that will focus on fully encapsulated microservices, serverless models of uh, workload execution, hybrid deployments that are easily deployable in uh, public cloud managed uh, container services. Uh, they'll also be event driven by default. So we're gonna see this uh, shift happen where we begin to treat batch processing models as an exception rather than as the starting point for doing that integration. So later in this presentation, we'll specifically discuss the IT and business benefits of the more modern uh, data mesh approach. So hang tight while we get to that a little bit later. So most importantly, uh, it's crucial to recognize that we cannot simply take these old style data hubs, you know, put them in the cloud and call it a data mesh. It, it doesn't work like that. There's no magic there. The, the whole purpose of a data mesh is to decentralize the processing model while still providing a world-class self-service experience for the data product owners. Without the decentralization and decomposition of the data hubs, we can never truly achieve the DevOps benefits that agile organizations truly need to support you know, rapid iterations that the business demands. Um, those demands around innovation as well as continuous integration, continuous delivery of the data products that these um, integration and mesh environments are supposed to be producing. So what exactly is a data mesh? You know, in kind of our discussion of a data mesh, what we really begin with is this notion of a data product oriented aspect of a data mesh. And this is where, you know, the whole purpose or the whole reason for existence of these environments is to help businesses achieve greater value out of the data assets that are being produced throughout the IT environment, throughout the business applications, IoT environments, the analytics. And um, so we begin with this idea of a, a data product oriented focus. So low code, self-service, uh, easy to use access to producing data products. The second characteristic, which we've already discussed a little bit about, is this is this, these data mesh, they're, they're designed from the ground up to be decentralized. Um, a decentralization is important uh, for the, the main reason that we see our customers today using uh, software and services across multiple public cloud vendors, on-premise environments, private cloud environments, edge and edge compute, as we see the emergence of 5G technologies, um, the gateway technologies on the edge will become even more important. And we're seeing uh, computing environments, compute environments that are capable of, of doing um, substantial workloads being push, pushed further and further into the devices that are, surround us in the real world. So these kind of decentralized processing models uh, will become more and more the norm. And it's, it's really having a data integration environment, a data mesh environment that accepts this decentralization as a fundamental premise of workload management uh, is crucial to moving to the future. Uh, the, the third area that's crucial for the future is uh, scaffolding the data integration architecture in a way that begins with the assumption that we're working with event streams, that the streams of data are continuously happening around us, that we're not driven by a scheduler, but that we're driven by the events of what's happening in the data tier. And so that streaming centric model um, is really uh, crucial for the starting point of a modern mesh, rather than making the assumption that everything is driven off of a 24 hour batch schedule, we begin with the assumption that everything uh, can be triggered and should be triggered um, as the events uh, go through a life cycle, you know, moment by moment. Um, the fourth thing which I'll point out on this slide is just this notion of polyglot data format. So polyglot, it's a fancy word. It basically just means data comes in multiple shapes and with uh, different kind of semantic characteristics. Um, this is extremely important because across the modern enterprise, the ecosystem of data has changed rapidly in the last 10 to 15 years. We see more and more data being born in these semi-structured formats or loosely structured formats. But we also still have these large-scale enterprise systems, ERP systems, financial systems, you know, healthcare telecommunications, that all operate off of um, 
applications and data models that require strong data consistency, strong asset properties of managing the data. So what's critical in a data mesh that uh, spans operational as well as analytic environments is it's not just about the, the JSON formats, the Avro formats, the XML formats. We also need to maintain the relational consistency and uh, the, the, the strong transaction boundaries of uh, applications that are producing these events in strongly consistent environments. So as we propagate that data throughout the mesh, we have to maintain the consistency of um, the, the, the data that's being produced uh, uh, by the sources. So uh, when we kind of net out what this means to move from the monolith to the mesh, there's these kind of five big characteristics. We're moving uh, from a world that treated data as a byproduct of the application to treating data as the fundamental product, the, the fundamental output of what's being produced. We're moving from a world where our applications and our data integration hubs were monolithic and centralized, even when they live in the cloud, by the way. Um, these, uh, these, uh, these centralized data hubs or data lakes, they're still monolithic, even if you're running them on a public cloud. Uh, we need to move to a world where the, the data infrastructure is distributed and decentralized in nature, you know, kind of fundamentally building on this assumption that we're going to be working with data whose life cycle will span multiple virtual cloud networks um, and multiple cloud providers. Uh, we need to move from a world where the waterfall style of managing data integration deployments and, and doing uh, development operations is now moving more towards these agile methodologies where we can support continuous integration, continuous delivery. Uh, some in the industry talk about this as a data ops model. Um, what we'll put forward in this assertion around the data mesh is that you can't really achieve a full agile data ops infrastructure until you move off of these centralized monolithic uh, frameworks. Uh, it's really crucial to move to a microservices model to actually achieve agility. Uh, we're gonna see this shift away from the fundamental assumption that your data architecture begins with batch processing into a model where your assumptions begin with event-driven streaming by default. And that will allow us to scaffold a data-centric uh, infrastructure where the latencies can be very small. Uh, the, the function of when to receive fresh data should be driven by the business, not by the limitations of IT. And in order to achieve that, you need to have the infrastructure and the architecture in place to support these very low latency operations. And then finally, uh, for the fifth attribute here, in the old world, we had this kind of fundamental seismic disconnect between transaction processing systems or applications and the analytic environments that ran them. And so this, this uh, schism between OLTP and, and OLAP for analytics processing typically was bridged by these ETL hub and spoke architectures. So you have transaction processing databases, then you have ETL hub and spoke architecture that, the, that would output the data to your multidimensional uh, analytic you know, uh, data warehouses. And so this was kind of the model, OLTP to ETL to OLAP, and you have this kind of split between the, the fundamental data architectures on the left hand and the right hand side. We need to move to a, a world where in the data mesh, it's really about the intersection of these two approaches, the same types of data and transaction boundaries and events that we produce on the transaction processing side should be instantly accessible to the analytics processing environment uh, that's doing uh, the, the downstream analytics in a different type of workload pattern, but the mesh of the data and how we view the data uh, should be uh, nearly instant and it should be really the intersection of these two uh, environments and, and not kind of this this hard line between them. So that's what we also expect to see from, you know, joining up the operational data with the analytics data. So, you know, the, the whole purpose, as we said before, with the data mesh is to produce data products. And the reason why we produce data products in the enterprise is for data consumers to get value out of them. So in this chart, we're going to start by looking at the left-hand side, and we're going to work our uh, sorry the right-hand side, and we're going to work our way to the left. Data consumers are the business users um, that are actually doing work with the data, 
uh, making decisions, uh, providing end services to customers, for example. What we see is that in the modern enterprise, especially where we kind of build out this, this idea of the data mesh and evolve that to the future, there's a class of um, provider here, a special type of data analyst called the data product owner. And these data product owners, they kind of sit between the business and IT. They can be technically savvy, but most importantly, they're experts in the domain and they understand uh, what um, models and algorithms and service APIs need to be produced in order to achieve the highest value out of the data assets that are continuously being produced by the applications and the, the sources of the data, like IoT devices. And so these data product owners uh, really are the, the users. They, they are the, 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 the people uh, making use of these data mesh uh, capabilities. The, the mesh itself um, can have multiple tiers of data semantics. In this particular diagram, we're showing a common approach uh, to scaffolding the, the data semantics where the events, uh, whether the events are coming from enterprise applications, enterprise databases, or IoT devices in the real world, all of these events flow into a raw data layer where we see the data within milliseconds of the data being born or the event happening, we see it in its rawest format and we can take action there. Some applications and, and data product owners uh, wanna see that, that data in its rawest format. But it's imperative to be able to move the semantics and elevate the semantics up the stack so that we can work with data that has higher levels of trust, filtering out the bad data, you know, only uh, uh, merging uh, records so that you can see it in the same format as the source system. And then ultimately, um, for most enterprises, you want to get to some type of master data approach or canonical data where you're merging data sets that might span multiple applications, multiple IoT devices. And that's really where we see this idea of a data mesh that can be optimized for different product owners and different use cases uh, that product owners may have. So whether they're consuming data at an SQL level, uh, more at an alerting or an event level, uh, you know, looking for a fully synchronous copy of data in a tabular format, or you know, all the way up to elevating data objects in the same kind of business object model of the originating application, or even in an uh, ontology, that is um, uh, aligned to the overall business and not just a single application in the business. So we have these kind of phases that data can move through and in a real-time data mesh, all of these semantic operations, the transformations that are happening on the data, they're happening in a continuous flow of events. So rather than in the old world of a monolithic, you know, batch scheduled ETL job that wakes up on a scheduler at midnight, you know, and runs a bunch of transformations, what we're really talking about here are stream processors or pipelines that are always open. And as these events arrive, you're manipulating and transforming the data, elevating the semantics to make it more consumable for the different use cases. So we have these knobs and dials here that we can play with. If you have a data product owner that's more interested in the highest fidelity and the lowest possible latency of the events, you give them access to the raw data. Uh, as those events are being born, you can push those directly to the, the data product owners and they can build products and services with the raw data. Uh, for example, training machine learning models. Uh, but if you've got other data services where you're interested in pushing out, you know, let's say master data records of customers, for example, or products, maybe you want those canonical views of the data that have been highly curated, highly prepared. Um, there's a lot of data quality routines that have been put into them. For those data objects, um, you may want to go through multiple stream processors, you know, and instead of getting millisecond level latencies, you might be dealing with latencies that measure in the tens of seconds or single digit minutes. But you're never going to go backwards to this world where you're looking at, you know, kind of 24 hour cycles, batch cycles uh, to move data. We're, we're really talking about minutes and seconds for most of these workloads. And then finally, this type of architecture needs to be decentralized by design. The whole concept here 
is that the, the workloads that you're running for the stream processors, the workloads that you're running for the change data capture, the workloads that you're running for the event-based messaging platforms, you should be able to choose which environments, which clouds, and which tools are um, you know, important for you, for, for, for your use case and still maintain some control and observability across those. So that's where a uh, decentralized uh, architecture by design comes into play is that you should be able to operate these environments on multiple infrastructure, multiple clouds, uh, multiple gateways and, and platforms and not be tied into a model where a vendor is coming to you and saying, oh, just bring everything to my object store and bring everything uh, to my you know, big data infrastructure in, in my data center and, and you'll be fine. The, the reality is that for most of our um, uh, 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 customers, the, the workloads are inherently gonna span on-premise environments, you know, multiple cloud providers, maybe uh, multiple private clouds. You still have, you know, what could be B2B exchanges that need to happen. So the, the real world complexity of how data is born and the life cycle of data uh, from cradle to grave requires that we have to have some type of mesh framework to understand what data looks like as it moves across these, in, these environments. So that brings us to these, uh, what we call the DevOps attributes for data integration mesh. As we've been talking about from a physical deployment perspective, a data integration mesh should be deployable in most infrastructure. You know, that doesn't mean that you can't use proprietary vendor serverless environments. You absolutely can. So the mesh, a particular mesh node um, could be tightly coupled to a serverless environment that happens to be running in a particular cloud vendor's uh, ecosystem. The point is, is in the, the control uh, uh, row, this is the next row, is that even if you happen to be running some workload in a uh, tightly coupled serverless environment, you should still be able to maintain observability routing and security across that broader life cycle. So even if I push a workload into a, a particular serverless environment on some public cloud, I should still be able to see and understand how that workload relates to other workloads that might be running outside of that serverless environment. The latency characteristics of a data mesh, a real-time data mesh, uh, should be focused on streaming and streaming pipelines by default. Um, of course, there's still gonna be many, many use cases where batch processing is gonna be uh, really a necessary choice. Uh, but when we begin with the assumption that we try to solve the problems uh, that the business are bringing us with a streaming architecture first, and then we check down to a batch processing model uh, secondarily, then we begin to scaffold up a solution where we can dial the latency that's needed for the business without having to work from a batch model where everything is batched by default. We discussed a little bit about the polyglot uh, data handling. You know, more and more of our data payloads are shifting uh, to these uh, JSON and graph formats. And of course, a data integration mesh uh, needs to be able to handle payloads that are JSON, Avro, uh, graph, you know, XML, et cetera. But we also need to be able to preserve the kinds of relational semantics that come with columnar and row-based relational systems. So many of our source applications and a lot of the most important ones, general ledger systems, you know, telecommunications uh, systems, healthcare systems, uh, require strong uh, governance, uh, strong data consistency. And when we respond to kind of the audit and regulatory environments uh, for some of these most important uh, ERP systems, it's really important that the mesh characteristics preserve those relational semantics so that you have trust in the data as it arrives into the analytics environment. So that uh, it includes data governance controls, just like you know, data integration um, hubs of the past. We need to be able to support uh, catalog functionality, uh, data lineage across the mesh, data validation to ensure that the output, the mesh matches the source, et cetera. And then finally, from a DevOps and a continuous integration, continuous delivery standpoint, uh, we need to be able to work with these agile uh, methodologies when workloads are running in uh, vendor-managed solutions like serverless or managed containers. 
as well as customer managed environments where our customers may be operating their own Kubernetes framework, their own OpenShift framework, running their own Docker containers. Uh, we work with a lot of customers where they basically support their own uh, quote unquote as a service operations for these um, mesh capabilities and that needs to be part of that, that lifecycle control as well. So these are some of the core attributes that we look for when we, when we envision a runtime environment for the data integration mesh. Uh, this is kind of a visualization of what that might look like from a, a, a graphical standpoint. You know, a couple key things here to understand is that we envision a future where workloads may need to run on the edge, workloads may need to run in uh, edge gateways. You know, you'll be doing things like capturing data events from the real world. You may have databases uh, running in the gateways or messaging environments in the gateways where you need to do some filtering. Um, there may be a consolidation and archival that happens in one public cloud vendor that's different from other public cloud vendors where you might be hosting um, your analytics environments or other operational environments. Uh, most of our customers today have a mix of uh, business applications where uh, many of their business applications have already moved to the cloud uh, with a SaaS based model for, for uh, native cloud applications and for those environments, you need to be able to support the capture distribution of business events from within the SaaS frameworks. But then there's uh, typically a mix of on-premise applications that continue to be important as well for you know, general ledger or HR um, supply chain. And for those uh, on-premise applications, you also need to be able to capture events both in the application tier as well as the database tier. Um, more and more of our customers, particularly as we look across the globe, um, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, the, many of them need to run data in local countries for, for regulatory and compliance reasons. And so we see these um, uh, cloud at customer environments becoming increasingly popular in many regions of the world. Uh, not just Oracle, by the way, but uh, Oracle, of course, started this whole trend and is a leader here. Uh, but we see other public cloud vendors, you know, offering now uh, cloud at customer type solutions as well. But when you run these, you still need those behind the firewall at customer deployments to participate in a mesh. Um, so it's, it's critical to kind of have the ability to capture distribute and perform workloads, even when those systems are running behind the firewall. Um, and then ultimately, um, from an analytics standpoint, you might have multiple data lakes. You might have a data lake that's running on uh, you know, Microsoft Azure. You might have an analytics environment and a data lake running on uh, Oracle with Oracle Autonomous Database uh, within uh, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. And having the ability here to move transactions in real time, continuously across multi-cloud environments, on-premise environments, SaaS applications, edge and edge gateways, you know, that's really uh, an example of where this, this data mesh uh, type of capability uh, is going to go. And so, you know, this workload coexistence is a theme that you heard from me, you know, several times so far. And if we break this down, it's really about supporting some customers that run quote unquote as a service in their on-prem data centers. They're running their own OpenShift. They're running their own Kubernetes framework. They've got uh, experts that deal with infrastructure, but they're doing their pod management and their container management themselves. We need to be able to support them with uh, the cloud networks that they're running on premise. We need to be able to support uh, vendor managed solutions where when you're running uh, one of our services in an Oracle uh, cloud infrastructure, you can run that as a serverless model where you're only paying for the minutes and the seconds that the workloads are running and we're taking care of uh, all of the backend uh, infrastructure and management of the underlying software uh, platform services. And then uh, the third kind of model here is a hybrid infrastructure where you might be um, building your own Docker containers, but you actually host and deploy those inside of a managed container framework uh, from multiple public cloud vendors. And so in these hybrid models, our customers are running their own software of their choice and, and, and taking ownership of that, but they're um, hosting those on compute infrastructure and container infrastructure from the public cloud vendors. So this workload coexistence is really, really important 
uh, to support in the mesh because our customers will have these mixed modes, you know, oftentimes even within the same data flows. Uh, the data flow will be moving across applications and pipelines uh, running in these different kinds of uh, environments. So it's crucial as data is routed through these environments that we are focused on maintaining data consistency in the, in the pipelines. So uh, data consistency, as I've said several times, you know, it's, it's not all just, you know, Avro and JSON out there. In the real world, uh, when you have transactions that are produced in high value environments on the OLTP side, you need to have trust in the data that the commit boundaries are respected, even when the commit boundaries may span, you know, dozens of different tables. Um, you want the reliability guarantees and you want the semantic uh, correctness that comes with uh, producing data into um, targets that may not have the same controls as the source databases. So, you know, it should go without saying, but we'll say the obvious, you know, Kafka is not a database. Another thing is that, you know, object storage environments, which everybody is, is really excited about for data lakes on the cloud, object storage is not a database. And so when you move transactions from source systems that are relationally consistent and have strong consistency guarantees into environments like object storage and Kafka that don't have those guarantees, you need to take extra steps in order to preserve the correctness of the data. And that's where tools like Oracle Golden Gate kind of do this. We have a lot of experience over the last several years kind of helping customers with these patterns, everything from managing the op types of uh, inserts, updates, and deletes, and marking those in the metadata to what we're kind of showing here, which is <clears throat> using uh, system change numbers and commit sequence numbers to help uh, decorate the payloads that end up on the non-relational systems. But even in these environments, you're kind of shifting the burden of maintaining transactional consistency to the consumer rather than uh, letting the, the tooling um, maintain consistency for you as you would with a, with a database, for example. Um, so let's give an example of this. Um, one of our uh, larger customers that does this and probably everybody here has, has used them is, is PayPal. So PayPal has a fast data architecture infrastructure that's really supported on uh, you know, delighting their customers. PayPal as a company is extremely focused on um, generating high levels of customer satisfaction while maintaining trust in their transactions. And so their fast data architecture for sending uh, transactions, sending money across the wire, there's synchronous activities that happen when you're actually making, um, you know, pushing the button to send the money. And then there's asynchronous activities where you may go back later uh, even if it's just a couple button clicks later, to look at uh, recent activity. And so those are uh, on the back end treated as asynchronous events. And so within a PayPal infrastructure, you've got these microservices tiers that do the synchronous workloads for actually you know, uh, generating the, the money transactions. And then there's these uh, workloads that happen to move data across the wire to different data centers and different geographic locations uh, where there's another set of microservices that are performing additional activities. So in this case, we're looking at kind of activity streams. But when you have this overarching goal of delighting your customers and providing high customer satisfaction, you need to focus on always providing correct data. So they're shooting for 100% correctness. You're shooting for very low latency, in this case, uh, always less than 60 seconds, rain or shine, um, and scaling to uh, hundreds of millions of events uh, per day. So when PayPal was kind of going through this um, uh, solution engineering, they were looking at a variety of different ways to solve this problem. One, one way they looked at is, you know, looking at multi-phase commits um, generated from the microservices layer to multiple databases. Uh, but in this case, you'd be giving up um, some availability characteristics in order to achieve high consistency if you want the 100% correctness. Similarly, they looked at event sourcing patterns uh, for microservices using a distributed commit log, uh, something like Apache Kafka, for example, um, to use that as an intermediary layer. But then you'd be giving up what's called the read your writes uh, consistency um, across uh, transactions when you've got you know, multiple consumers uh, that are, are looking at the same messages as they're being pushed into specific partitions. Uh, so what they ended up going with, of course, is a change data capture solution where you get guaranteed 
consistency um, with very low latency uh, characteristics. So um, you're looking at kind of the 100% correctness uh, guarantees with the, the scale that you need to run the business. And so that's really where you know, PayPal was able to achieve uh, these benefits in a microservices based architecture spanning um, events that span uh, thousands of kilometers, getting 0% uh, percent data loss or corruption, you know, very, very uh, high levels of uh, consistency around uh, latency guarantees, and then, you know, ultimately being able to scale to hundreds of pipelines and multiple terabytes of, of data streamed uh, throughout the day globally. So, you know, this is a great example, I think, of where that data correctness characteristic is so important. And as we see here, also um, supporting very fast uh, pipelines, we, you know, when you shift to this model of streaming first or events first, it becomes important to be able to handle the kind of ETL operations that you used to do in a monolithic centralized architecture. You need to be able to do those same ETL operations continuously throughout the day uh, in these stream processors. And so this could be as simple as um, just uh, you know populating uh, uh, columns in a, in a row, or it could be much more complex like producing you know, aggregate views of master data objects that get pushed uh, to, you know, pushed out by, by data services. And so um, having this kind of rich, flexible environment to do aggregations, joins, windowing, uh, business rules, and even analytics on the data that are flowing through the pipelines, like uh, time series analytics or machine learning based classification and scoring, um, really critical, you know, as part of this, this process. And so that's, you know, you know, just to kind of net out what we've been talking about for the, the data mesh, there's a set of benefits that are kind of IT focused and there's a set of benefits that are really important for the business, you know, more on the lines of digital transformation. When we look, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a technology guy, so I talk a lot about the, the tactical solutions on the IT side, 100% correct data like we saw with, uh, with the PayPal example, you know, being able to go across thousands of kilometers, you know, keeping data in sync with very low latency, uh, being able to distribute your data lake so that you can run, you know, uh, one or more data lakes in different environments using technologies like Object Store and Kafka, but having enough semantic richness to maintain consistency in your data. Shifting from a batch processing model to a streaming model so that the business can innovate faster when you move to a continuous transformation and loading model rather than a scheduled one. And then this uh, idea of an agile, you know, DevOps-based lifecycle that uses the benefits of microservices as opposed to kind of these large-scale hub-and-spoke monoliths that are much more difficult to work with in an agile way. So, so those are IT benefits. But on the business side, what you're really doing is you're empowering these these high level use cases where these use cases are about improving customer satisfaction, improving uh, customer engagement by producing next best action activities or you know, real time coupons where you're, you know, interacting with the customers of your business in near real time operations and you're pushing them alerts based on activities that you're collecting and gathering in real time. It's about um, improving you know, supply chain and inventory management so that you're reducing the lag, improving the observability of what um, is moving through your supply chain. Events that uh, could have uh, previously taken you know, days or in some cases weeks to process uh, using kind of older style of analytics, we can now uh, get visibility into you know, backlog and supplier delays, and we can see all of those alerts on a real-time, moment-by-moment basis uh, with these newer uh, event-based technologies. Similarly, with location intelligence, helping our, our customers kind of correlate uh, device events that are happening in the real world with the location of whether that's you know, trucks or boats or you know, ships, aircraft, you know, people, you know, phones. Uh, but being able to correlate uh, what's going on in your back-end systems with what's happening in the real world, huge, huge uh, amount of innovation happening here uh, globally. And then finally, everybody is jumping on the predictive analytics train right now. So looking at ways uh, to monetize data, provide new, new kinds of uh, services that are um, produced from having faster 
more accurate visibility into uh, data events in the back end systems. You know, we see a lot of our customers actually looking at producing um, new you know, kind of for sale service opportunities out there based off of these, these business events. And so these kind of four areas on the right hand side of this chart is where you begin to see the strategic benefits of moving to a data mesh solution is that you're really empowering the business to do things with data that you couldn't previously do when you were based off of a centralized monolithic type of architecture. So when we think about, you know, Golden Gate, you know, why Golden Gate? What's so unique about Golden Gate that, that, that makes this kind of compelling and why are we even doing this here at Oracle? So the thing with Golden Gate is it's already had, uh, over the last two decades, it's already had this foundation in a, a couple of unique areas. Number one, we provide this event detection for all popular data stores. So you've got these relational and NoSQL engines where Golden Gate is already providing kind of millisecond level access to events that are happening in those systems. Not just, you know, uh, DML events, but in many cases, DDL events as well, or stored procedure events. And we can kind of emit these events continuously from uh, all these popular data stores. Um, we have this um, high-speed data replication protocol. So Golden Gate's been used for uh, high availability across thousands of kilometers for over 20 years. So we've got this high-speed data replication that moves data across wide area networks um, uh, in a very reliable way. And these next two bolts are kind of key to that. You know, because Golden Gate kind of had its foundation in high availability disaster recovery, it's an extremely trusted framework that's used pretty broadly uh, across you know, thousands and thousands of customers globally for these high value use cases where people are moving money, um, they're, they're tracking uh, call records, they're you know, working with you know, healthcare and highly regulated uh, data sets. And so it's trusted to never lose data. It's, it's uh, seen broadly as a very strongly kind of transaction safe environment for dependable analytics and, and applications and so you know it, it and and then it works at this web scale you know we can process you know millions of events uh, per minute we can move terabytes of data per day in some cases terabytes of data per hour off of single tables um, you know we we have these massive massive web scale use cases that can support so so those are kind of the triggers where, where people have begun to, you know, use Golden Gate for these mesh capabilities. And what happened approximately three years ago is Golden Gate launched, uh, first in the industry, by the way, first in the industry to launch a fully microservices-based architecture for replication, uh, which we've been out with. Actually, it's been about three and a half years. And so Golden Gate itself is a set of microservices that are um, fully encapsulated. We don't require a shared data model. Uh, these are, are, are not, uh, you know, we don't have these frameworks that are required with tight coupling across the, the services. Everything, 100% of, of the operations uh, to Golden Gate are through uh, REST-based APIs. Uh, so our UI, uh, we actually maintain a command line utility for Golden Gate, but it actually, on the back end, it uses REST to talk to the, to the microservices. So you can have your own services talk to Golden Gate over REST. We have a embedded uh, JavaScript based UI inside of every single microservice for Golden Gate. And, um, you know, the command line utility that's there for Golden Gate talks to the services via REST. So it's this entirely REST based architecture. And we did this, you know, we knew, you know, starting five or six years ago, that cloud was the future. And we, we moved Golden Gate to an entirely uh, REST based microservices architecture precisely because we knew that we had to operate it at scale in the cloud. And so this is what really allows our customers to operate Golden Gate as a service, manage it in a container, have high security for uh, uh, communications across virtual cloud infrastructure. Um, and you get the, the DevOps benefits of extremely rapid upgrades, um, extremely rapid patching process, uh, because everything's designed around encapsulation and, and microservices best practices. So that kind of allows our customers to use Golden Gate as this, I'll use a phrase here from the microservices community, it's a transaction outbox for the whole enterprise. So we can basically look at events that are being produced by you know, all the popular databases that your, your customers are running, you know, all the, the, the base messaging services that are producing 
uh, messages and, and messaging frameworks like Kafka and, and JMS, as well as a huge array of uh, applications, uh, on-premise applications, as well as SaaS applications. So we can capture these events in near instantaneous kind of real-time manner. We can send them downstream in a trusted way. We're not just um, a, 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 a vanilla messaging framework here. Remember, Golden Gate is used for disaster recovery and high, avail high availability. So when we move the messages downstream, the events downstream, whether that's to a database, cloud environment, a big data environment, a SQL environment, or a stream processing environment, um, you get all of the inherent resiliency characteristics of Golden Gate for high availability, for trusted data sets. So you get this kind of trusted transaction outbox for the whole enterprise. And that's really the foundation of our mesh story. But we've extended that um, mesh story in the last uh, three years to also include real-time stream processing. So the vision that we're working towards now, it's not just about the replication of events and the replication of data. It's also about being able to help our customers in the mesh work through those three layers of data mesh characters from raw data to curated data to master data and uh, be able to process all of those in a reliable stream processing environment that has the same core characteristics of Golden Gate's uh, trust and reliability, maintaining transactional consistency, but also, of course, being able to work with the variety of polyglot data formats like, you know, Avro and, and JSON and XML and uh, Parquet and, and graph data. Um, so, so that's really what we've produced today, and it's the direction that we're going down is a single pane of glass for a fast data mesh that allows uh, data product owners, data product managers to work with uh, the, the underlying characteristics of this, uh, this system to produce high value data products for the, for the business. Um, and so when we look at the, the frameworks that we're building now, Golden Gate as a, as a platform is supporting cloud administration for distributed decentralized deployment of the Golden Gate uh, uh, infrastructure. So you can run you know, on the edge, we can run in the public cloud, we can run as a, a uh, uh, in the Oracle Cloud, you can run it on premise. Uh, we have the, the data ops or the DBA uh, people that are, um, you know, very focused on database to database mesh operations. So uh, high availability, uh, multi-active deployments. We have the data engineers that are focused on pipelines and big data and streaming use cases. And then we have these data analysts. I'm starting to look a lot more closely at what we call data product managers as a, a specialized data analyst role. These are really the individuals that are focused on producing uh, high value data products that the business will consume. And probably most fundamentally for this discussion and what we've been talking about, this entire framework can be deployed um, in a mesh across Oracle Cloud, third party clouds, on-premise data centers and embedded edge. You can run it in containers, you can run it in uh, Kubernetes, you can run it, um, we have serverless capabilities that are, that are coming up very soon. So uh, the whole point of this is that uh, you get the deployment flexibility that you're looking for from a mesh while still being able to drive these event-centric uh, streaming processes across any infrastructure of your choice. Um, the, the product owners, I can't emphasize enough, we're, we're looking at um, you know, high level and analyst role, but we also see kind of the emergence of what's called the age of the data product managers. And so we really see um, this platform as being uh, the, the kind of tool that a data product manager would use to create data products for consumption by the business. And so whether that's, you know, analytics, um, for example, providing real-time dashboards or embeddable uh, real-time graphs, um, it could be um, data models or domain objects. Uh, they get produced as, you know, payloads, let's say Avro or JSON. Uh, payload that's uh, pushed out of a pipeline, for example, could be a data product. Um, the algorithms, um, I've got an upcoming talk in this mesh series where I'll focus on this a little bit. The actual algorithms or the business rules they get put into data pipelines are actually very much part of the data product because that's where we encode um, the, the business uh, policies that are executing on, on the data. And so being able to succinctly manage those pipeline policies or even tie in with machine learning models uh, that have been produced in uh, notebooks, for example, integrating those into to data pipelines. 
And then finally, um, looking at these data services and, and APIs and the output of what we load, for example, into data marts or data warehouses or, or object stores as data products themselves, really key uh, to kind of this vision of a, a, a data analyst or a data product manager kind of going forward. And that's why, you know, the capabilities that we have today inside of the uh, Golden Gates uh, stream analytics area, you know, very much on this path right now uh, for producing compelling data products, whether those are time series analytics, uh, event driven uh, dashboards that can be uh, pushed out to the executive suite, uh, providing um, data products that are uh, built around geospatial analysis or engaged through uh, predictive analytics. You know, all of these are capabilities that we provide today within the Golden Gate uh, Stream Analytics. It's all low code, it's all self-service. Uh, you can run it in Oracle Cloud um, uh, by the minute, but you can also run it in, uh, in public clouds, uh, other public clouds as well, if you're hosting it yourself. So, you know, underlying this whole framework, you know, you have to have trust and governance on the data. And so that's something that's, that's built in as well. We've talked a lot about, you know, having trust in the, the, the transactions. Um, the framework for the low code environment is there as well. You get the workspace management, you have the built-in catalogs, including support for lineage. Uh, Golden Gate uh, provides the highest levels of security, um, you know, banks all over the world, payments platforms all over the world rely on Golden Gate. So that security is one area you can absolutely uh, trust is at the highest levels. Um, we have the conflict detection and, and data verification rules to make sure that, you know, as data is moving around through the mesh, that we can, you know, guarantee um, consistency and validation of the data sets that, that move through um, the, the, these environments. So those aspects of, of governance are really key to how our customers trust Golden Gate to run the business. So, you know, all of these use cases taken together that we see, whether it's continuous ETL, time series analytics, you know, building data products, this is part of this whole shift that we see here. I, I quoted Roy Schulte from Gartner here, but what, you know, we, we see this widespread awakening to use Roy's uh, words uh, on event-driven architecture. And we think those are gonna be the drivers that move more and more of the data integration ecosystem towards these data mesh uh, architectures. And so it's that shift towards being more event driven, more stream based, uh, supporting continuous flow of data and microservices events that will transform us away from the old world of monolithic architectures to these new world of uh, data mesh capabilities. So really the call to action here is, you know, like which journey are you on? Are you, in, you know, doubling down on the hub and spoke architecture? Are you just going to take the same old kind of ETL patterns and data lake patterns that you used to run on your on-prem monoliths and then put them into your cloud and run them in, in the cloud as a monolith? Or alternatively, are you interested in exploring more about the data mesh? And so that's where I'll leave you with, you know, reach out to us, you know, here at Oracle, ask us for a demo. Uh, pull down the uh, Forrester paper on data fabric where Oracle was rated number one as strategy for the enterprise data fabric. You know, take a look at some of these additional YouTube videos that we've got out on the Golden Gate channel, or even take a look at, we have a free trial of the Golden Gate Stream Analytics um, tool that I, I showed some screenshots of earlier. There's a free trial out there. Um, that anybody can get some cloud credits and, and get it up and running in, you know, less than uh, five to seven minutes as well. So, you know, you can try this stuff out. So, so reach out to us. Really appreciate your time today. Um, we'll, uh, hopefully we, we answered some questions in the, in the Q&A and on, on the chat areas. And, uh, you know, look forward to, to hearing from you all um, uh, at, a, at a later date. So thanks again for joining and uh, look forward to connecting later. Take care.